Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, Hi. good day, good afternoon, good evening to somebody, uh, depending on where you are. You're very welcome to let us know uh, who you are, and especially from where you are actually uh, logging in, so that we can uh, see the the spread, the geographical spread of our audience this afternoon here in Denmark, uh, where I'm sitting. And uh, John, he is in uh, the UK, and Jörg, he's sitting in Germany. Um, this is a very new concept that we're trying here. So uh, please let us also know how we're doing um, this head-to-head, -head, as we call it. It's a sort of a, an idea of uh, we bringing uh, topics in to the arena. And then uh, we'll uh, see how John and York is performing with their each their own, uh, say, uh, topic on 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 or uh, subject on 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 the topic that we're discussing today. And that is today it's uh, the TXV thermostatic expansion valves versus the electronic expansion valve, the EEV. Um, but let's just have a presentation of the. Uh, of us here in the studio. John, could you please tell us who you are and uh, what you do? Yes, yeah, certainly, Jens. Uh, hi, everybody. John Broughton from Danfoss. I have been in Danfoss for 27 years, started in refrigeration at the tender age of 16 and fulfilled many roles within Danfoss, but now work as part of the global application team with a focus on yeah, all sort of products that are sold through the wholesale channel. Also spend a lot of time doing uh, YouTube webinars, et cetera, uh, and also time on site. So uh, yeah, I've been in the industry quite a few years now. Uh, I won't tell you how old I am now though. <laughs> <laughs> Great, John, thank you. Jörg, uh, and who are you and where are you? Well, uh, thanks and welcome everybody from my side as well. I am Jörg Saar, sitting in Germany. I'm located in Germany, and as you probably can hear, I am a German. Looking very much forward to, to that discussion. It's going to be interesting to, to have this really discussion that one is an EEV, the other one is a TXV defender. Let's see where we end up with that. I'm in Danfoss for quite some time as well. Um, been in different jobs, always in refrigeration, air conditioning, and now as John in the global applications team. Great, thank you. And myself, I'm a moderator today, and tomorrow I'll be the senior content expert. Um, and I've been with uh, Danfoss for almost half a century. So I know a few things about the company. Um, my background is technical. I've been technical writer. I've been teaching uh, and uh, been dealing with uh, digital communication of all kinds the last 20 years. Um, please be so kind and, and feed us your questions as we go along. Uh, it would be very nice to, 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 um, to, to learn how you are looking at things and uh, what kind of questions you have. So please, Feel free to, to ask any questions you, uh, you would like. Um, and also during the talk, during the discussions, um, let, us, let us know how we're doing with emotion. Uh, no, what are they called? Emojis, yeah. And, and uh, cheer for your uh, preferred uh, te te uh, technique. Um, we have before, done... we go, before we go on, Jens, I just see how many people are dialing in and from where and i'm i'm amazed it's it's around the world i see kenya yes. i see oman kosovo i I've, I've seen tunisia pakistan india um, france the us uh, germany so really wow. everywhere um yeah. it's it's amazing so welcome hey we are we are excited yeah yeah, yeah. Brazil it's always... just came up here yeah yeah I yeah. saw one from Peru the other uh, uh, Trinidad Tobago. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, great. That's that's fantastic. That's a nice uh, part of the world. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Okay. But if, before we actually start the discussion, could you please do us a favor and uh, give us a vote? And you do that by simply writing to us 
whether you are for a TXV or an EEV. And while you do that, um, just write it in the chat. And while you do that, um, I'll tell you that uh, John has been assigned <coughs> for this discussion as the EE, EEV expert, and um, Jörg will be the TXV expert. Okay, um, or should we say defending the two <laughs> de techniques? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's great, Jörg. <laughs> So uh, you'll have uh, a few moments to uh, to um, to put in your your votes. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, what you <laughs> yeah we should have like uh, <laughs> <laughs> the fight of the valves. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's great. EV, EV, lots of it. EV. Um, uh, yeah, very good, very good. I, I've lost count. Completely. Keep it coming. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> I'm for the TV, TXV. Hey. Okay, we, we've got a question, Jens. We've got a question. Yeah. Yeah. A uh, few actually. A few. Um, yeah. Yeah. Our backend uh, uh, guy, uh, Anas, he'll pick up on the the questions as we go along. Um, what should we? What should we? Uh, Dive into it. Let's let's take uh, yeah, Rick well, Sherman. He's he's asking: Do leak test die if dies effect on the operation of a TXV or EEV? Uh, Jörg, would you please take your TXV answer to that first? Yeah, sure. Um, these leak test dies just to make sure I understand that in the right way. That they are kind of colors or, or stuff that reacts to ultraviolet light. So you see that and then you can see where the leak is. You really visually see that. I think that's what you what you talk about, Rick. And in general, well, no, they don't really affect the operation of the valve as long as that material is not in any kind sticky so that that any moving part inside the inside the valve would start to to stick somewhere perfect yeah. john do you have anything on uh, the eev for that i would say exactly the same as Jörg. so long as it is compatible with the materials inside the ev and it's not uh, thick or viscous in any way then absolutely fine so uh, yeah, no issues. And obviously, in uh, you know fairly large systems, it's sometimes quite a challenge to uh, find a leak. And I know there there is these proprietary systems that, as Jörg said, use an ultraviolet lamp. Um, so I'm sure they've been you know fully tested, etc. Perfect. Um, okay. Um, just just to start off uh, the discussion, um, uh, a question to both of you. Um, and, and we'll take it uh, the answer uh, one at a time. Uh, what are your main arguments for the expansion valve that you are presenting? Uh, John, let's start with you. What are your main arguments for the EEV? Um, I'd probably say the main arguments for the EV in there is a, a very small EV, ETS-6, um, electronic expansion valve, stepper valve. The, the, the main argumentation I would say for EV is um, yeah, the sort of two or three main ones. Probably the main one is that valve will work on almost any refrigerant that we have. So we don't need to have a separate code number for all the different refrigerants that we have um, out in our industry at the moment. The other uh, main focus or benefit of an EEV is that it doesn't rely on uh, a pressure drop as much as a mechanical valve does to operate. So we can have a lower head pressure. Lower head pressure means that we save energy. and also the fact um, that this can go down in, let's say this valve has a capacity of 10 kilowatts, which is there or thereabouts what an ETS-6 can do. Um, it has a capacity of 10 kilowatts. It can actually regulate down to uh, one kilowatt. So it can regulate down to 10% from its maximum capacity to its minimum capacity quite easily. So if you've got something like a blast chill, blast freeze application, where you start off with uh, a high duty 
and then you need to regulate down to a much lower duty to actually hold that room at a specific temperature when you've actually done the majority of the cooling the valve will regulate quite happily down at 10 percent so uh yeah that was a very quick summary but uh, those are my argumentations great Jörg, what about you um what would you say is your primary argument for for the txv well i i get and understand all john john has mentioned what of course is necessary uh, to for an eev is to have a controller and to have a, to have sensors to to measure and so on that is not the case on a thermostatic expansion valve the thermostatic expansion valve is one component it's one valve maybe two so you have to insert an orifice but okay but it's it's really one con component you don't need any power supplies you don't need to pull any sensor cables any power cables nothing you have no controller settings you just put it in it's it's easy fast it's easy to understand and it simply works that's that's the big pro on the thermostatic expansion valve great thank you uh we've got a question from uh wagas ahmed um how an ics uh, valve works i think john that's probably for you the ics is uh, an industrial expansion valve so fairly large duty um not I guess what we're talking about today, we're talking more sort of commercial. Yeah. But the ICS valve, basically, you have um, a, a pilot orifice, and then you have the the main orifice. So yeah, it's in essence a very large expansion device. Um, no different to, you know, something small here. We have a, as I said, the small ETS six. It's direct acting. We've got the. Uh, stepper motor and then we've got the orifice in this part of the valve here in ics that is a, a much larger module on top which then controls the um expansion part of the valve itself but it's it's just a much bigger con mm. you know valve itself and then you have your controller um to to control that that separately um in, in essence when we talk about electronic expansion valve you know they're all doing the same thing they're they're taking a superheat measurement so a temperature measurement and a pressure measurement so we're measuring the superheat across the evaporator that is then fed into a controller that then feeds out to the valve and opens or closes the valve to regulate that superheat so it doesn't matter whether it's a you know small uh 600 watt um valve or a couple of thousand kilowatt valve it does exactly the same thing great thanks um we have a question from ot chatongit i think it is pronounced i'm not sure uh what is the substance of that always that always gets stuck in an eev john mm, substance well <laughs> <laughs> in some systems and I've, I've come across various things over the years uh the strangest thing i found stuck in an ev was a plastic cover off a sight glass that was stuck in an akv20 but i don't think you're talking about that no. it, it might be the fact um and it, it depends on the system a lot of oil separators fitted now particularly the helical type are very very efficient which then remove a lot of the oil that's circulating around the system so that can actually cause the ev and other components to actually stick so that it could be lack of lubrication within the system um it could be foreign bodies it could be moisture um anything like that um so i, I can't say it's one specific thing it might be an accumulation of things but the worst thing in a refrigeration system is moisture because that will uh, you know generally cause havoc to any expansion device and actually freeze in the uh, the point of expansion within the orifice so yeah. that's maybe what we're talking about. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Um, one no, one other possibility might be when you move or when you retrofit from one refrigerant to another. And in case you had an R22 system and you retrofit to another refrigerant, which has no chlorine now, and you retrofit to another oil, you might get a reaction with some remaining oil and some remaining R22. And then we've seen that in the past that there are chemical reactions which generate uh, something like chewing gum. 
and and you can find that in a system as well but it's unclear whether it is this or not mm, yeah that, that's a good point Jörg, actually because i know when we change from you know let's say uh 22 502 um to the newer refrigerants the polyester oils and, and we're, we're very good at scouring all the debris within the system and bringing it back to the compressor but in that actual action that uh, like let's say debris could get stuck in things like the expansion device so uh, yeah it could be a lot of uh, issues i guess mm. but i've never seen the chewing gum scenario so that's a new one on me yeah, yeah i've seen a Great. few units. um I, uh, we have a question here um, from Yazid Dabo. Uh, what's the predefined value of superheat in a TXV and an EEV? Um, Jörg, could you please take the first one? Yeah, the sure. TXV? Yeah, um, predefined. Well, the TXVs, at least the Danfoss TXVs, they come with a so-called factory setting. That means there is a certain superheat setting when these expansion valves come from the factory. And that is now 5 Kelvin. You can change that, that setting according to the need. And typically, it makes sometimes, uh, well, quite often, it makes sense to adjust that setting. But these 5K, they are usually quite good for many, many systems. It's high enough that these systems work safe and work stable, but it's low enough to have the system efficient. The, the higher you have your superheat setting, the more stable you get the system operation because disturbances don't really give a problem with the system. But with a high superheat setting, you lose a little bit of efficiency. And that's why you try to reduce the superheat setting. And uh, that gives the problem of instability. So these 5K, Danfoss has chosen the 5K to, to say, OK, that's, that's a reasonably good compromise here. But you can adjust that. It does not mean that every system needs to run on these 5K. That's good. OK. Uh, we have a question from Nirai Verma. Uh, why is um, there? What, what, uh, Jens, what, sorry, wait a minute. That, yeah. that, uh, sorry, um, but yeah. there was that question. What is what is kind of the factory setting coming with an EEV? EV. Oh, and, sorry. Um, yeah. John. yeah. Yeah. No. Um, thank you, Jörg, for that. Um, yeah. I mean, within a, a electronic controller, and it depends on if it is a wizard setup or a menu system. But basically, you would set a minimum superheat and a maximum superheat. So minimum four, uh, max eight, typically. Uh, and then that controller would find the minimum stable signal within that evaporator to work at. So you give the controller a range to say, I don't want to go below four, and I don't want to go above eight. And then within that uh, setting range, it would find the, the minimum stable signal or the MSS curve within the controller to then predefine where it should work. So you need to give it a little bit of range to find that minimum stable signal so that we're not getting uh, liquid, you know, back to our machine, but we're running the evaporator as fully flooded as we possibly can. Okay, thank you. Um, coming back to uh, what I was starting on, sorry for interrupting. <laughs> uh, that's uh, Nira Burma, who is asking, why is there a problem sometimes with water accumulating in uh, an evaporator of a VRF system with an uh, electronic expansion valve? Hmm, I don't honestly know, Jens, to be honest. The, the only way you could say that there was moisture in the system um, to start with and the vacuum procedure wasn't uh, you know, good enough to pull all the moisture out of the system because if you've pulled your correct vacuum um, and you've removed all the moisture from inside the system, then you shouldn't have water there uh, anyway. If it's a water-cooled system, then if it's if it's a water cool condenser for example then you know you might have a leak somewhere within the water cool condenser that's getting into the refrigeration side uh those are the only two sort of uh things i could say yeah Great. and um maybe one remark water and the evaporator i don't think it is eev related um it's just that most vrf systems have an electric expansion valve 
so I don't see a relation to the, the expansion valve. And as far as I understood, there are quite some BRF systems which do not have a filter dryer because mm -hmm. um, the, the idea was not to use one. And, and then you might, you might uh, end up having, having that water because your refrigerant was maybe not pure enough when you filled it or your vacuum procedure was not okay, whatever. Okay. Mm. Okay. That's an interesting point, Jörg. Yeah. Was there a reason why they didn't fit a filter dryer? Well, some, I, I don't agree to that argument, but sometimes I hear, well, it's, um, the, the, the system is kind of factory made and it's dry inside. Mm. But when you open it, you know, when you work with it, when you charge the refrigerant, so you always have a chance to get some, some humidity in, right? Mm -hmm. True. True. Okay. Great. We have a question from uh, Gurav Sadavati. I hope it's correctly pronounced. Which valve do you prefer for low ambient temperatures? Uh, yeah. Mm. Would you go first this time? TXV, of course. No. <laughs> 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 um, well, um, uh, on a low ambient temperature, I guess now let's let's assume some some things. Your condenser is outdoors and has a very low condensing temperature or a low temperature because of your low ambient temperature. Let's assume your evaporator is indoors and and due to that has a, a more stable evaporating temperature. That means that the pressure difference between outdoor and indoor is getting smaller. And um, if if you don't do anything, I have to admit that the TXV <laughs> comes to its limits at a certain point. And then, John, you can take over and say that the EEV <laughs> might be better here. <laughs> John? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, I was just uh, joking. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree, Jörg, because the function of the, of the EEV is not dependent on the pressure drop across the uh, orifice itself, whereas with the EV it is. But I would say, you know, any system with with low ambient temperature, and again, it depends what we're talking, low ambient, whether we're talking zero degrees C, whether we're talking minus 20 degrees C, minus 40 degrees C, um, you will get to a point in, in any refrigeration system, no matter the, the type of expansion valve, where you physically won't have enough pressure drop across that system for that natural cycle of you know refrigeration to function um but low ambient yeah an eev is better um and that's one of its uh benefits is to get the head pressure as low as you uh, as low as you possibly can because then you save energy for every one degree kelvin you reduce your head pressure you save roughly two percent energy um so yeah that's a good point Great, thank you. Oh, camera's gone strange. Uh, yeah, well, uh, David, no, sorry, Rudy has a question. Uh, TXV is sized according to the cold room requirements. What is the benefit in regards to efficiency when uh, with a change to, uh, no, I guess it's in, in, in comparison with the EEV. Is that correct, Rudy? That it's a question of uh, the TXV uh, for cold room uh, sizing and and uh, the EEV. So I, I guess it's yeah. You, if you would compare a TXV in a cold room to an EEV in a cold room, do you see any efficiency benefits with an EEV? Yeah, I guess great. that's the question, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, I guess you, you you can take that one, Jorg. It's a fairly straightforward answer. Yeah, well, um, if if the code room is running on pretty stable conditions, and you adjust your superheat setting in a good way on the thermostatic expansion valve, you don't necessarily see an efficiency improvement. If and and now, John, if if you want to go in case of, <laughs> then you can you can see an improvement. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I would totally agree. I mean, th this question comes up a lot. Is you know that better or that better? Now, if that one is set up absolutely, uh, you know, 
correct and it's not just taken out the box and put on the system and left. Um, if that's set up and that's set up on a Coldrum application, and I'm not talking blast chill or blast freeze here, but as Jörg said, you know, stable conditions, then both is good. Um, one interesting point to, to sort of note that if you have an issue in your cold room, um, let's say, uh, and I'm going back over the experience, but let's say somebody's installed the evaporator very close to the wall, so there's not enough air movement around that evaporator, um, and they've had a, a TV fitted and it's not working very well, there is this, or there was maybe, a general sort of opinion that, okay, let's stick an electronic expansion valve on because that will overcome all the issues. Actually, that will make the system operate worse because this is faster reacting than that one. So to answer, the, to coming back to the original question, if it's a cold room, stable conditions, both is good so long as they're, they're set up. If there's an issue with the airflow, the evaporator, or things like that, EV will actually make it worse. Um, so yeah, just be aware of that, I guess. Great, thank you. A question from Ishant Sharma. Which valve is better to use in heat and cold model? Uh, so for a heat pump, I guess. Yeah, that's also my interpretation. John? Um, I would have said, um, I would have said a TV, uh, personal opinion. Yay. But I'll be I'll 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 be corrected <laughs> by uh, York. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, um, a, a bit into the theory of of expansion valves. A thermostatic expansion valve has has a specific uh, characteristic, and you can bring. The, the operation curve of the thermostatic expansion valve pretty close to the operation curve of your evaporator. And as long as you stay close to that point where they are close to each other, so if you don't move too far away, that means if your temperature variations are not too big and not too big are uh, some 20K or something like that, then the TXV works absolutely fine, works great. If you if you have larger deviations in the same system, um, let's let's say you you evaporate at minus forty as well as at plus sixty. I don't know. Then the thermostatic expansion valve has a bit of a challenge because the thermostatic expansion valve is a line. The, and then the evaporator is a is a bent curve. So now you try to bring that line close to the bent curve, but if you go further away in capacity and temperature difference, then this bent curve comes away from the line of the thermostatic expansion valve. And that's where the electric one is better. That, that point would go to you, John, um, <laughs> if you would have these large variations. But if you have if you don't have these large variations, the thermostatic one is a great valve, is as good as the electric one. It's it's stable. It's it's easy to to use. It's all fine. Hmm. Great, thank you, Jörg. Totma Bote Simbine, what ex what EXV do you advise to use in the cold room in remote areas? Gion? Um, mm, um, remote areas, and I guess by that we're talking uh, remote parts of the world, maybe. Um, uh, what are the do and don't? Not that it comes in. Okay. Um, I think I sort of uh, understand the question, but if we're talking, you know, if we're talking remote parts of the world, then obviously, as we've said, you need power supplied to the controller, etc. Um, so long as it's set up right and it's set to do the job, then no issues. I guess the, the issue comes down to uh, power supply uh, and power supply fluctuation, things like that. Um, I, I can't add further comment. Jörg, I don't know whether you can well, uh, uh, add, add, add to that. Agree to what you said, and that's the reason why I would go for a thermostatic valve. 
not only because I'm defending thermostatic valves here, but um, <laughs> as, as you say, a remote area, you might have a power failure. On an electric expansion valve, the, power, the, the expansion valve stays where it is if we have a stepper motor valve. It might stay in a half open position, whatever. You don't know where it, where it currently is when the power fails. On a thermostatic expansion valve, you have a power failure. You typically have your solenoid valve ahead of the expansion valve. The solenoid valve falls closed. Boop, that's it. And, and there is no more refrigerant flowing into your evaporator. And, the, and 10 minutes later, your power comes on. You start your compressor, and the evaporator is full of refrigerant. That is possible with an electric valve, which does not have a battery backup. Mm. With a thermostatic valve and a solenoid valve ahead of the thermostatic one, which is the typical solution, you don't have that problem. And that's why I would go for the thermostatic solution on remote areas. And it's it's yeah. just easier, right? It's you don't you don't have the, to set up the controller and everything. And if you need to get an installer who is not comfortable with all the electronics, well then the thermostatic one has has an advantage again. Yep, I agree. Damn. Great. <laughs> we uh, have another question from uh, Hassan Chief Chiglu. I'm terrible at uh, pronouncing surnames. Which type of expansion device is better for control of humidity fluctuation of control volume? Mm, that's an fluctuation. So you mean when you when you have a room uh, that, that where you do air conditioning or cooling, and in that room there are a lot of fluctuations, a lot of humidity fluctuations. I guess that's that's the question. Um, good question. Mm. Which which type of expansion valve is better there? Mm. I, Let me I think. think. That, yeah, John. Yeah. Go. No, I, I would have said, I mean, if for humidity control, you want to maintain uh, a stable suction temperature, evaporating temperature. Um, so that is a lot to do with the the system design itself, capacity control on the compressor, speed up and slow down the compressor so, so you maintain your evaporating temperature. But then also if you maintain um, a stable superheat on your system, then you will also even out and, and stable down your humidity. Um, but again, this comes down to that question of if it's set up correctly, whether it's EV or TV, they'll both do you know as good a job. Um, maybe the EV would get down to the the stable operation quicker than a than a, a, a TV. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah. Well, I'm 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 thermostatic. I'm defending thermostatic ones, right? Well, then I don't have an argument. No, just joking. <laughs> uh, I, I have something something that that would favor the electric expansion valve when we talk about that humidity control. Just an example. Just imagine you you cool down your room. You have normal cooling control, and now you want to decrease the humidity. What you might want to do is to reduce the evaporator temperature to to condense more humidity on the evaporator. With a thermostatic expansion valve, that is not possible. You cannot have an influence on that. With an electric expansion valve, you can tell the controller, close the expansion valve a little bit. By that, you inject less refrigerant. By that, you reduce your evaporating temperature. You have a colder surface you have more dehumidification. So uh, that, that would be uh, mm. an, an option you can, you can use. Um, and that's why maybe if, if you want to, to dehumidify on purpose uh, quite a bit sometimes, it, it might be an advantage to go for an electric one. Mm. Yeah, so you're pulling more moisture out the air because you have a, a slightly lower evaporating temperature yeah okay but m might be one idea that that you mm. go for that you cannot do that on the thermostatic one you can only do that on the electric one yeah true mm. don't 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 feel guilty Jörg, that you are i do <laughs> <laughs> 
I still love you. <laughs> Good. Uh, I have a question, or we have a question, sorry, uh, from Kaiser Abbas. Uh, why does the superheat oscillate both in TXV and EEV? Ah, um, mm. I, John, do you want to go? I can jump on that no, if you like. Go, go. Well, the, the main reason is that uh, oscillations come, come from the evaporator. Every evaporator has a specific curve um, below a certain superheat at a certain load condition. The evaporator becomes unstable, you can say. So the, the superheat is no longer stable. That curve, if you want to go into literature or whatever, um, that curve is called MSS, which stands for maximum, ah, wrong, minimum stable superheat. So below that minimum stable superheat, it is no longer stable. That's why it's called the minimum stable superheat. If you go lower than that, you start to see oscillations and the valve tries to follow that and counteract, but the evaporator constantly gives these oscillations and the valve starts to try to react to that, but it cannot follow. If that happens, increase your superheat a little bit and then you come above that minimum stable superheat, which is a different value for every evaporator. There is no general value, but every evaporator has that. And as soon as you are above that limit, your superheat is stable again, no matter what what um, expansion valve type you have. John? No, totally agree with uh, with Jörg on that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it all comes down to if you have issues with the evaporator location, the uh, particularly airflow on the evaporator, if you have any flash gas in the liquid line that's feeding the evaporator, things like that. So there's, there's, there's many things that can affect the performance of the evaporator. In a lot of cases, people instantly blame the expansion device for causing the issue, but in a lot of cases, it's more the application of the evaporator itself, the location, the airflow, iced up, you know, blockages, thing, things like that. Um, so yeah, it, it's not always the valve. Um, a lot of the times it can also be the application as well. Oh, and, and one one point, sorry to come back to that, Jens, just, just two sentences. What's pretty important as well is check whether your sensors, no matter whether that is an electric expansion valve, your temperature sensor, or this sensor bulb here for the thermostatic expansion valve, whether that is still tight on your suction line. If if that is no longer really tied to the suction line, then you don't have a thermal contact here, and then your your expansion valve is not able to control anything in a good yeah, way. True. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was just uh, uh, so, sorry. sorry, Jens. I was just looking for a bulb strap, Jorg, in my uh, my box of bits to to sort of. Um, uh, go over that point you just mentioned. Make sure that bulb is is nice and tight. Um, I spend quite a bit of time on site over the years, and you'll see, you know, tie wraps, uh, electrical tape. Um, sometimes you won't see anything um, <laughs> yeah. that's attaching the bulb, or it's flapping around in, you know, free air. So if you if you attach um, the bulb, and this, here's one we made earlier, a bit like Yorks. Um, make sure you put the bulb strap on, make sure it's tight. They're actually made now, so they deform this bulb slightly uh, onto the pipe itself, so you get a very good thermal contact. Please don't use tie wraps, please don't use electrical tape, uh, anything like that. Use the, the proper uh, bulb strap to do that, because as Jörg said, it doesn't matter whether it's the, uh, the TV or the EV, they only work correct if they get the right signals into them to actually function properly. So and it, it is a uh, insulated, insulate the bulb, yeah, insulate really the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, we, I mean, it would be really great if you have uh, further questions. Uh, we, we, we have them uh, coming, yes, uh, but we would like uh, further questions if you have any. There uh, is you a... have the chance now to talk to experts, ask uh, experts about uh, anything TXV, EEV, so uh, please go ahead. But we have a question here from Yahya uh, Henblas. 
Can we put an EV? Sorry, can we put EEV with solenoid valve to overcome power failure? And I guess, John, that's one for you. Yes, we can. Um, this is a, as Yoga said before, this is a, a stepper valve. So if you have a power failure, then basically it stops where it is, um, depending when the power failure happens. So it could be open, could be closed, could be somewhere in between. Um, you can either put a battery backup to, uh, to physically drive this valve closed, or yes, of course, you can put a solenoid valve ahead of the expansion device, so that in the event of a power failure, then uh, you know the solenoid valve closes. Um, we've also this is a uh, stepper valve. Now, I've not got in my uh, my box of bits, unfortunately, a, uh, a pulse valve. So we also make the the AKV valve, which is a pulsing valve, which basically uh, works on a pulse, six second pulse time. So it's either opened or closed or any part of that, but that valve is a fail-safe valve. It works with a solenoid valve. Um, if I can just go off camera uh, very quickly and try and find something in my box of bits here. So um, pretend that this is an AKV valve. It's not, it's a solenoid valve, but pretend it's an AKV valve. Um, AKV valve, um, pulsing valve has an armature has a solenoid coil which is pulsed. So that armature uh, goes up and down quite uh, rapidly, as I say, on a six second pulse time. But the, the pulsing valve is fail safe. So if we lose power to the solenoid coil, then the valve closes automatically. So it depends on the technology of the valve, but anything other than a pulse valve, if it's a stepper motor, then yes, you can either put a battery back or you can put a, uh, a solenoid valve ahead of, uh, of of that to uh, to sort of negate that issue. Um, so uh, you you yep, might have happy. you might have seen me smiling when that when that uh, question came in, and I took uh, whatever John said is absolutely true. It was just a crazy answer I had in mind. <laughs> I just wanted to say no, you you cannot because it it has no influence on the network on on, on your power utility whether they have a failure <laughs> or not when you put a solenoid valve there just joking i mean yeah. Yeah. of course uh, everything that john said is absolutely correct yeah. uh, but i guess it i guess it also depends a bit on, on on the system and and especially the the electronic controls that goes with it right yes. because you yeah. you actually do have uh, uh, power backups uh, cases also uh, that yes. would actually, in case of a uh, power out, you would uh, actually uh, close that um, um, stepper motor valve uh, quite easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the opening and closing times of the stepper valves are, you know, pretty quick. This is something like three six seconds somewhere around there. So uh, you know, they are fairly fairly uh, fast. Um, Jens, we, we have a question from Varum actually below, which is a little bit of a difficult question, I guess. Um, and it sounds like something like a blast freeze. So they're going from uh, temperature change from 180 to minus 70. Wow. Yeah. At a um, ramp up of three degrees Celsius per minute. Per minute. Uh, yeah. yeah. What wow. is the suggestion for that? <laughs> if it um, works, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. What is the application, um, Varum, on that one? What What are you cooling? Because to go from 180 to minus 70, that's that's quite a temperature swing. That must um, be a test chamber or something like that. I guess it's it's got to be. It's got to be something like that. I mean. The other question, and this comes back to, to what we said before, um, if you want to regulate down at a lower percentage, so let's say you've got 100 kilowatt capacity and you want to pull and you want to pull the temperature down and then you've got 10 kilowatt capacity. So that's, that would be the case for EV because that will happily regulate down 10% of its maximum capacity, whereas a TV 20 25 percent of its maximum mm -hmm. capacity so then you're talking 100 kilowatts to sort of 20 25 kilowatts so it depends on your application varum as to if you want to regulate down at that minus 70 and what the heat load is at that point 
then an EV would be better. But I can imagine in a test chamber, you've got various circuits within the evaporator. So it might be multi-circuit, it might be multi-evaporator. So yeah, it's a little bit difficult to uh, to go further without knowing the, the specific application. I mean, both, you have anything to add? Both valves, I would say, are pretty much outside their, their data sheet specification. I mean, I'm not aware of an expansion valve that that is made for 180 degrees. Even if that is inside the test chamber, your refrigerant might only be 100 Celsius in the evaporator yeah. when it comes. Or I, I don't know, but yeah. it's it's pretty much outside typical specifications. So there is there is no clear winner to say TXV is better, EEV is better in that case as john said eev can handle lower part loads txv um, might be fine with you that that you don't need to to play around with the control of the valve the txv is doing that by itself and you can take care about controlling the rest of the system and and handling these these huge temperature swings so I don't see a black and white answer here. Sorry. Mm. Yeah, me also. Me also. Yeah. But we we also got an answer from uh, Varun on what it is, the application itself, and it is a test chamber. Wow. So we're uh, yeah, <laughs> that's great. Um, thank you for the uh, questions. Just keep keep them coming. We are, we are living out of questions here, so yeah. don't starve us. Uh, we is... have a. We have a question from Chris Bust, which is actually related, John, to what you said before. Uh, the question is simple. What is EEV pulse? EEV pulse. Um, well, if we talk, as, as we said, that is a, a, a stepper valve. So that has many steps. And uh, ETS-6, uh, quite a few hundred actual steps in the position of the uh, actuator and the, the orifice. If we talk about a pulse valve, now the, the AKV works on a six second pulse time. So if I can just turn around and hopefully the camera is a little bit clear. Um, yes, that's good. Yeah, that's good. So there we have zero and there we have, uh, let's say 100%. So an AKV works like so. Basically, you have 0% open and 100% open. So we have a requirement and we, we pulse that solenoid valve. The valve opens and we have immediately 100%. And depending on where it is in the six second cycle, um, let's say if it was open 100%, it would be always open. So instead of it looking like, like so, if it was permanently open the valve would be there so it, it's always open if it was open 50 percent then we would basically um that is uh, zero and that would be six seconds actually it's the it's the other way around um let's take it that way so go there so if it was 50 percent open it would be open for 50% of that six seconds. So that is a three second pulse of being open. And then it would close, then it would open again. So every three seconds, it would be open. And every three seconds, it would be closed. That would be 50%. Um, and then obviously it can regulate anywhere between that um, six seconds down to uh, you know one second. So it, it all depends on what is actually needed and how much liquid we need to supply that evaporator. So I hope that is uh, yeah clear. Yeah, we have a we have a term which we call pulse width, width modulation. Uh, yeah, exactly. So um, that that says uh, something about the pulse width, whether it's 50, 60, the, 40 percent maybe yeah. of the 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 full. Uh, uh, pause time. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, a question from Petros Dalavuras. What is the minimum delta P for TXV and EEV respectively for floating head pressure? Hmm. 
Mm. John, well, no, Jörg, would you, Jörg, would you please go ahead first? Uh, yeah, you you can kind of select that because you can live with a pretty low delta p even on a thermostatic expansion valve, but that means you need to have a pretty large orifice because that 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 valve will only open a very little bit and to get your capacity, you need to have a large orifice. When then later on your delta P gets bigger, the valve opens more and you are kind in an overcapacity situation. The valve needs to close down. So if you oversize a thermostatic expansion valve, you can reduce the minimum pressure difference between uh, suction pressure and, and condensing pressure. But to give you a number, um, if if you try to go below four bar, then it's getting a real, real challenge. And four bar is already quite low. Anything below four bar for a thermostatic expansion valve, I don't say it does not work. You can do it, but it's getting a challenge to, to have it operational and to keep the system running at higher differential pressures. And with that, to John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, John, uh, Sorry, please go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I totally agree with everything Jorg has said. Uh, with an EV, um, yeah, two bar, one and a half bar, uh, an EV will, will quite happily function. But the, the, the same rules apply. Um, as as Jörg said, if you have a very low pressure drop across the valve, then you oversize the valve. Um, same scenario. But if if you want a number, then one and a half, two bar. Um, I have heard people quote even low, sort of half a bar. But I've always said sort of one and a half, two bar, as a, as a number, um, is okay. So uh, we win. <laughs> <laughs> that was a win. <laughs> Great. Uh, Rudy is asking, which, with regards to the TXV, <clears throat> is it necessary or beneficial to wrap it with insulation material, including the bulb? Uh, Jörg? Well, let me let me change your question, <laughs> or, or by by answering that, change the question a bit. Always use insulation material on the bulb. So the bulb should always be insulated. The valve itself, it doesn't matter. Um, but the bulb should always be insulated to be able to measure the temperature of the pipe where it's sitting on and not the temperature of the surrounding. So always insulate the bulb. Now too, is it beneficial to insulate the valve or not? You don't need it in general. Sometimes it is beneficial. Just imagine you have a valve sitting somewhere high up in, on the ceiling there and that valve um, is getting cold and you have water condensing on the valve and it drips down maybe to something that stands below the valve. Then it can help to have the valve insulated because then you don't have the water dripping. But, and now comes the big but, attention, if you have a valve that has a so-called MOP function, so maximum operating pressure function, and you insulate that valve, then you might get a problem because now your valve can get colder because of the insulation than the bulb itself, which is not a problem with a valve that does not have the MOP. But if you have the MOP, you need to make sure that the bulb is always the coldest point. So if you insulate the valve now, your valve might get be a problem, uh, might might have a problem and cannot work anymore. So to, to summarize again, always insulate the bulb, the valve, that there is no real benefit and, and need to insulate it. Agree. John? John? Um, I've just done a little sketch, but I don't know whether you can see it on the camera that well. Um, total agree with with what Jörg said. 
um, I've had scenarios where we've had charge reversal where the TV is actually in a roof void, for example, and you've got a coal store at plus three, but the roof is, you know, minus 10. Uh, and instead of the charge being on the bulb or in the bulb, it actually uh, reverses and goes to the top of the valve. So uh, that's the only time I've ever insulated a TV to try and stop that uh, charge reversal. Mm. Um, but, Perfect. Yeah. Jörg, any any thoughts? Any comments? Good, bad? No, no nothing. Nothing in in addition to that. What you mentioned. Agree. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Uh, we have a question from Pedro Correa. If a CCM stepper valve loses the steps, uh, that is the power failure. How will it adjust to adjust to controller regulation? This is th mm. that's a. a a very good um, question, actually, and, and something that is incredibly important with stepper valves, and I'm doing myself injustice here, I guess. Um, but a, a stepper valve, <laughs> stepper valve, has a, a motor, a stepper motor, and there's there's many steps. And in some of the bigger valves, you know, there is a, there is a lot of steps in that. Uh, and over time, the valve can lose or skip a step. So the controller itself so we've got a controller there we've got a stepper valve there the controller forgets where the valve is so it doesn't know whether it's 70 percent 30 percent 40 percent or whatever so what you're supposed to do with uh, any stepper valve is that when your machine or your compressor is not running or is not able to run you need to close a contact on the controller and that then force closes the stepper valve and it recalibrates the valve and the controller together so that that controller knows that that stepper valve is at zero percent so never leave uh, never have a, a plant where you never power down the stepper valve um, the stepper valve should only be given a signal to run if your machine, your compressor, is running or is able to run. If it is not running or it's not able to run, then this should be powered down and then it recalibrates the two together. So uh, that's quite an important um, statement. So Great. I hope that uh, answers that one. You, uh, Jörg, any comments? Well, uh, apart from I try to find something positive for thermostatic expansion valves here, <laughs> we don't have lost we don't have lost steps on thermostatic no. expansion valves. No. <laughs> Great, thanks. Uh, Ricardo Vargas is asking, what do you recommend uh, uh, EEV or TXV for a split system on uh, ten ton? Um, Jörg, uh, well. <laughs> I would recommend to have a Danfoss valve, no matter whether it's a thermostatic <laughs> or, an or an electric one. No, seriously, um, it's, I, I, at the moment, I don't really see see something where I would say it, the, the thermostatic one has an absolute advantage on a split system or the electric one has, has the advantage on a split system. I, I just don't see it. It doesn't really matter. No, no. I mean, if it, and again, if we're talking, um, generally people refer to split system as AC. But if we're talking refrigeration, then yeah, I totally agree, Jörg. The only time I would see a benefit, as we've said, if it's something like a blast chill, blast freeze, mm -hmm. where you need that reduction in capacity and control at that reduction in capacity. But apart from that, yeah, that's the same answer. Mm. Yeah, great. Varun Av has another question. <clears throat> In AKVP, like you explained, it is completely open or completely closed. Can we open the orifice of the AKVP partially? John? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, no. Um, the, the only thing that, that's worth mentioning regarding the AKVP is that in the, uh, let's say, the previous versions of the AKV, it opened and closed quite uh, quickly, whereas the AKVP has a slower closing function. So you don't have these uh, pressure peaks and this noise in the system. But no, with the AKV, it's either 
open or it's closed. Um, at least to the best of my knowledge, let's say that. Jörg, I don't know whether you, you to can answer totally. any further on that. No, I totally agree. There is no possibility to to keep to keep that somewhere in the middle. It's it's either open or closed. Closed, yeah. 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 The only thing that you can do in the controllers is if you wanted to reduce the period time from six seconds down to three seconds, you can do um, on certain applications, things like plate heat exchangers that don't have a huge refrigerant volume. Mm -hmm. um, you could reduce the period time, but then you also reduce the lifetime of the AKV and the seat, etc. Mm -hmm. um, that's the only other sort of comment that's worth making. Yeah. Yes. It's 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 the pulse width that um, regulates the yes. uh, capacity. Dim Dal is asking why will an EEV offer greater capacity with a lower evaporating temperature for a given condenser pressure than higher evaporator pressure once the condenser pressure drops below a specific value? Wait a oh. minute, I need to read that again. Yeah, yeah. Me too. <laughs> why Greater capacity with a lower evaporating temperature for a given condensing pressure. Okay, then higher evaporating pressure once the condenser pressure drops. You know, especially. Um, um, well, why, why? John, if, if you want to answer, I, I, no, mind, I can jump, jump in. Yeah, um, go. So the greater capacity at a lower evaporating temperature for a given condenser pressure um you can you can have that because the thermostatic expansion valves lives on on the superheat and and the pressures so the, there is the mechanics inside that opens the valves and and the mechanics lives on lives on these pressures and the the, the, the uh, diameters of the diaphragm and so on you don't have that in an electric valve. In the electric valve, you have a motor that just opens the valve 100%, no matter what, if you like, right? If you like, you can open the valve completely. And um, that motor drives it completely open. And in some conditions, an, a thermostatic expansion valve might not be able to reach 100% opening degree, but the motor of the electric expansion valve can always reach 100% opening degree and can always give you the max capacity. And for a thermostatic one, that is not always the case because it depends on 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 this mechanics it has built inside. Yeah, that I totally agree, Jörg. The other thing that, that might be worth mentioning is that when you're at a much lower temperature to actually get superheat is a bigger challenge. And you mm. can actually have a situation where you get what we call sleeping evaporator syndrome, where the valve physically uh, can't open enough because it's not actually registering enough superheat. And as Jörg said, the uh, the movement on the uh, the push pin on the T2, for example, is something like 0.4 of a millimeter between fully open, fully closed. So the actual movement that you need on that is incredibly small, but to generate the superheat to do that at low temperatures, and, and we're talking, you know, minus 25, minus 30, is quite a challenge as well. Um, so yeah, that's uh, something that I remember years ago, Jörg, from one of the guys in uh, Denmark talking about. Yeah, that's true. Great, thank you. Um, we are sort of at the end of, of, of this session, uh, but before you leave, uh, could you please do us another favor? And again, uh, vote by writing in the chat, which one you prefer now? or which one is your favorite, uh, just for the fun of it, basically, to see if if we've moved anyone in uh, conve uh, convention, conv eviction, um, to see if anyone has changed mind. Yeah, okay. and, and then, um, John, could you please uh, give us your final uh, say, speak um, on, on uh, EEVs, uh, and Jörg, you'll have your say afterwards. Okay. Um, 
I, I guess this is a, a general speak, Jens, regarding expansion valve, and I'm not going to differentiate between TV or EV. The main thing to say is that, and I, I, I have to talk about EV, I suppose, but it'll work absolutely perfectly. Just make sure, and this goes exactly the same for the TV, make sure it is reading the correct pressures and temperatures on the system and it is installed correctly. Um, yeah, you know, that is uh, that is what I always say with, with any expansion device. With an electronic expansion valve, yes, it is more important because you have a pressure transmitter, you have a temperature sensor. They have to read the right measurements on the system. Otherwise, yeah, you're going to have issues. Uh, but that's also the same for, for the TV as well. So, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, agree. There is not a certain technology for everything. So it's it's. I have to admit, it's unfortunately not. You have to you have to listen now. Um, it's it's unfortunately <laughs> not that the TXV is always better, right? And neither is the EEV always better. You have certain advantages for for certain valve technologies, and if you use them in the right way, they are fine um, for 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 the right application. The good thing is you can choose and can use the technology that suits best for you. That's that's really how it is. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um... Yeah, I think uh, we are counting votes right now. Um, maybe we can just take uh, Varun's uh, question up. Uh, on what basis should we select NO or NC valves? And I guess it's the solenoid valve before the uh, mm. expansion device. Yeah, then I can jump in on that because quite often you have a solenoid valve ahead of the thermostatic expansion valve. And then the, the typical choice is the NC valve, which is normally closed. That means without power, it is closed. And you choose that one because when you have a power failure, well, then there is no power and the valve falls close. That's why you typically go for an NC valve which is the solenoid valve ahead of the thermostatic expansion valve. You go for a normally closed version, typically. Yeah, uh, and I can see they're still counting. So, um, Sashin Pereira has a question. What are the internal and external expansion valves? And if, if I may uh, interpret that, what is the internal and external um, equalized uh, expansion valve. What is the difference mm. between the two, uh, Jörg? Yep. Um, well, the, the expansion valve needs to know what the pressure, the thermostatic expansion valve, needs to know what the pressure inside the evaporator is. And that pressure needs to be below a membrane, a diaphragm that is inside the thermostatic expansion valve. Now, if it's an internal valve or internally equalized, whatever, um, but as soon as you see internal, there is a small hole inside the expansion valve and the pressure comes direct from, from after the orifice. So after the orifice, that's why you have your, your evaporating pressure. There is a small hole going inside within the expansion valve feeding that pressure below the diaphragm. That's the internal version. And now you can imagine what the external version is. There is no small hole inside, but there is a connector. Um, here we go. There is, you have the outlet connector. Uh, yeah, outlet, inlet, and then third connector is the external pressure equalization. Here, you would connect a pipe that comes from after the evaporator and feeds the pressure into the valve below the diaphragm here. Now your question might be, why should I want to do that? Well, this, the answer is pretty simple. If you have an evaporator with a big pressure drop or 
whenever you have a distributor after the expansion valve, you have a distributor and in the distributor, you have a pressure drop. Now your pressure in the evaporator is a different one than at the outlet of the expansion valve because you have the a pressure drop in between and that the expansion valve can see the right evaporating pressure. You need to feed it from the evaporator into the valve whenever you have a larger pressure drop and every distributor is a larger pressure drop in between. So with distributor, always, always external equalization. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we are at an end. We uh, ran 10, almost 10 minutes over time. Um, so let's have a look at the Really, the last count. For an hour. Uh, it's amazing. Yeah, wow. <laughs> That's pretty much. Uh, we have a we have a winner, not by much, but we do have a winner, <laughs> and that is uh, the EEV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I'm TXV. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, represented by John. So, uh, Jörg, better luck next time. It's uh, EEV. -E 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 24 and TXV 21, so it's a really small margin here, yeah, which is close. absolutely understandable, actually, because which is best? Nobody knows, I guess. That's it depends on quite a few things. Yeah. But we have a winner, and that's the EEV. Uh, please, guys, before you leave, also, please leave a note how you uh, like or dislike this uh, way of, of, of doing a, a, a live podcast, oh, sorry, <laughs> podcast. I'm thinking too much podcast. No, a uh, live event. And uh, let us know how you like it. Uh, please suggest uh, further uh, ideas for, for this kind of, of uh, live streams um, that we could uh, maybe uh, do another time. That would be really great to know how you, how you like it or dislike it. Uh, let us let us know. Thank you so much, and uh, John and Jörg. Uh, also, thank you to the two of you. Thank you. And thanks for everybody to uh, to join and to uh, listen and post the questions. Because, as Jens said, it's the questions that uh, you know make these type of events. So, uh, yeah, we we really welcome your thoughts for future editions. Uh, if it's good, if it's bad, and, and topics and all that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much for, for taking part. Thanks. Thanks to all of you as well. And Jens, you mentioned podcast. You have a podcast, oh, yeah. Chilling with Jens. A lot of interesting subjects. So whatever you want to learn, just surf any podcast um, offer and anything where you can get podcasts, Chilling with Jens a lot of interesting topics. Thanks everybody for listening in. Yeah, and if you are uh, German speaking, you have uh, Jörg's uh, podcast as well. Uh, what is it called? Jörg yeah, just recent, recently started. That's correct. We don't have that many editions as yours yet. And that is, and we'll probably never have um, because you keep going. And that is called Kälte Kreisläufer. Uh, yeah, that's great. Okay, thank you so much, uh, guys. Uh, from everywhere, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Excellent. We, we did. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. We did.